Friday night and he's pulling them over left and right. He sort of looks like Darth Vader with his gun and his radar and his flashing blue light. He drives a government squad car full of all kinds of hardware to handle the angry mob. And with his badge on his shoulder and his gun in his holster, he'll tell you he's just doing his job. Watch out for martial law. When he's out there watching after, if he's a tool of the bankster, he's a badge-wearing gangster, an agent straight from inner pool. Watch out for martial law. He's there to prove who owns the muscle and might. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, when I go to court, right, mm -hmm. is it on? Mm -hmm. All right, go when I go to court, off. I always take all my lucky charms with me, and I was one of the fellows that served with the infamous Apache Troop, 1st Squadron, 9th Air Cavalry. Uh, we were the fellows that were in the movie Apocalypse Now, where they told you, I love the smell of napalm in the morning, and that gentleman was exactly, was exactly like that. Uh, this book is done about the, the Apache headhunters uh, by a Cobra gunship pilot by the name of Jerome Boyle, who we used to call uh, Dirty Harry because he looked just like uh, Dirty Harry. Make my day. He used to have that uh, painted on the side of his aircraft along with Pinball Wizard and a few other things. Uh, this is a phenomenal book about a story of... Uh, Serious Americans. Uh, this is a Cobra pilot, Jerry Boyle's own story. A former policeman arrived in Vietnam in March of '70. He went from being a FNG, which I can't tell you what that is in a church, but it's bad, to a combat vet in just two months. Whether rescuing down crews, flying fiery combat missions during the invasion of Cambodia, or being shot down himself, Boyle saw war quickly turn from a scary game of bullets, rockets, and grenades to a terrifying race against death, where just split seconds could turn a scene of breathtaking beauty into one of stark, absolute terror. He witnessed men risk their lives daily to save others, and he heard the dreaded call, taking fire, taking fire. There were too often a fellow pilot's very last words before his chopper became an inferno. Boyle learned real fast that there weren't a lot of going-home parties for Apache troops pilots. And when you, when you listen to some of the stuff, this is a Cobra pilot's life and death experiences, in Vietnam's legendary Apache troop, first of the 9th Air Cavalry. This pilot was the recipient of, uh, he was a California native and former policeman of Ventura, California. Among the medals and decorations awarded to him for his service, and this was kind of typical of most of the people in this outfit. Silver star, three distinguished flying crosses, five bronze stars, two Army Commendation Medals for Valor. He now works as a pilot who flies in support of offshore operations. He lives in Andrea. He lives in uh, Oha, California with his wife Andrea of 20 years. And to read some of the stuff about this is absolutely phenomenal. Some of the things that get involved, I'll just read you the, the, a closing part of this thing to give you an idea. The Apache troop I served in wasn't part of the Army. The Army was part of Apache troop. We were Mavericks, but the kind of team that any commander with hair on his tailpipe would want his unit to be like. If you couldn't get what you needed to accomplish the mission through normal channels, we begged, borrowed, or stole it, usually the latter, with few exceptions. I'd follow the men of Apache Troop into hell, knowing full well, sooner or later, someone from the Blues, the Whites, the Reds, the Lift Platoon, or the Mess Section would emerge from a smoking hole, dragging the dead smoldering ass of the devil. <laughs> Now, he kind of exaggerates a little bit, but I can tell you that these men were phenomenal, phenomenal fighters, and it was my great privilege to serve with them. And when I go to court, I take all of my battle stuff, my, my ranger stuff, my first air cab. This is from the Apache Troop logo. There's my flight wings, the actual ones I wore. This is the first of the ninth logo that was put on the nose of all the aircraft. There's the first, there's first 75th Infantry Rangers. I have my uh, duty honor country uh, coin from the uh, MacArthur group of people. It's a special group of people that defend the Constitution. It's a silver coin that's given as a 
serious Defender Group Memento. This is MacArthur and it's solid silver. Then I got all my Ranger jump stuff. I put that on there. I take my Strike Like Lightning, Sound Like Thunder, all my Ranger stuff that when I was in the Rangers. And I take my first air cavalry when I was in Cambodia because I was with these boys in Cambodia and locked in. My Apache troop. <clears throat> That's right off of our shoulder patches from the Apache Troop, the original one. I was with the Take My Detroit Judo Club. This is a patch they give you for running 50 miles to save your life. you got a certain time to do it in. They give you a boot lace and a pocket knife, and if you get caught, they put you in a POW camp and treat you like a prisoner. So it's like you got 12 hours to run 50 miles, or, or you go to the POW compound and they treat you like... Uh, a POW. They hung my buddy up in a pit full of poisonous snakes upside down for about a day or two. <laughs> and then this is my other patches that I wear from, from Vietnam and Special Operations Group. I flew in support of Bogrites in Cambodia. We used to deliver their supplies. I got my my Ranger belt buckle. All these are mementos of a program, my Bronze Star Medal, my I have 33 of these air medals. I got five of these bronze stars. I got a distinguished flying cross, Vietnamese cross of gallantry, 33 air medals. Shot down four times, left for dead twice. Walked out of Cambodia with two regiments on my tail feathers. This is the SOG Special Operations Group Mac V that we flew in support of uh, Bogrites in Cambodia and mm. the Cambodian operation. I was one of the special air crews that was selected personally to fly the infamous marine sniper in Laos to shoot that general at 800 yards. I was one of the guys that flew him in. And we wear the wings of eagles. We support the National Rifle Association totally. You know, we ain't fooling around. We want our Constitution. We want our Second Amendment. I am a member of Vietnam Veterans. And basically, when I go to court, I put all my lucky charms in my pocket. It kind of drives them nuts down at the courthouse. I also have my flag. I always take my flag with me. And I have my Vietnam veterans belt buckles and my uh, De Oppresso Libre, which means the liberator of an oppression from the special forces that was given to me by the boys over there in, for helping them, you know. So all this goes in my, my pockets. When I go to court, my lucky charm, I call them, and it does, it's a little heavy, <laughs> but I, you know, it's like, when I go, I go for in memory of those fine soldiers, and some of the things, yeah, I'd rather be killing communists, that's one of the models of the paratroopers from the Charlie Company Ranger Company. Charlie Company Rangers was the boys that supported that paratroop, that, uh, that marine sniper that shot him, we, that shot that general at 800 yards. So I'm a soldier, soldier. I've been a soldier, soldier. I believe in the things that the soldiers have done. I've seen a lot of good soldiers pay the maximum price. Um, I personally held them in my arms, and I listened to their last words. Tell my mother, tell my wife, tell my family I love them. And to me, the Constitution is a very serious document, and we defend it to the death. We do not fool around when it comes to the Constitution. I've been doing it for 25 years. I am a graduate of Project Blue Book, the special project. I also take my harmonica. I have a harmonica. Which what drives was the special, uh, project Blue Book? Blue Book is where they pull their soldiers aside and taught you the Constitution. And I always take my harmonica and I give them hell. Give them the... Air transport story. <clears throat> yeah, well, we uh, we were flying interdiction along the Cambodian border, and we come up on the door of these uh, B model Huey. It was a smaller Huey, and it was uh, painted blue and silver. And uh, all along the side of the tail boom was white uh, powder. And uh, I informed the aircraft commander, and he told me he was hailing them on the hailing. I informed the aircraft commander, and he told me 
he was hailing them on the hailing frequency and he called them up and told them to land. We wanted to inspect their cargo and they told us basically to blank off and die. You know who we are? My pilot told him he didn't care if he was a man from GLAD. He was going to land that aircraft and we were going to inspect his cargo. Basically, he told us, uh, <clears throat> we're not landing. My pilot ordered me to roll my guns up and he shot them down. And we uh, went down there and we blew his landing gear off, shot up below his fuel cell, and uh, he got the idea we weren't fooling around. He went down and landed in the, in the rice paddy, and we inspected his cargo, and sure enough, he was carrying heroin. So the pilot gave him a choice. He could go to Long Bin Jail with us for contraband trafficking, or he, he could uh, hitchhike home, baby. So he chose to hitchhike home. Figured he had a chance. Of course, we knew that was going to be rather difficult in Cambodia, him being three foot taller than anything there walking. And a white man on top of that. But uh, we gave him a chance, and the bottom line is he didn't want to go to jail, so we uh, torched his aircraft and uh, we got back, and the CO, uh, Are you crazy? <laughs> Those people are CIA, they're going to kill you. I told them, Make my day. I said, uh, They were trafficking that dope to our GIs and uh, God knows who else, and as far as I'm concerned, we stuck it to them for about 15 million, and I'm just tickled, and if I could do it again tomorrow, I'd do it again. And that's a true story. We actually did it. So, anyway, to make a long story short, I'm a serious soldier. I love my country and its constitution, and I do not compromise when it comes to constitution. I defend to the death, and that's what we do. I have to get us off track, but how did you feel about that piece they did on day one the other night on Bo Grace? Uh, I thought it was kind of a little biased myself. They tried to paint him as somebody who's uh, setting up uh, another Waco, Texas, and. Uh, uh, that he was going to be one of these cultist type things, and uh, I, I didn't think they really played fair with the man. I, anybody who knows Bo Greitz, he's the most decorated soldier in the history of the United States. He's a very congenial gentleman. He, uh, when we worked with him in Cambodia, he was all business, all business, and uh, we flew his Fifth Special Forces people all over for whatever recon missions they had, and. Um, they got they got to work with us, and they know we were pretty serious folks, and. Uh, I personally think uh, Bo Greitz is uh, going to be painted as some desperado no matter what he does only because he is uh, is uh, associated with the avant-garde type uh, constitutional defense. He was the guy that got the Ruby uh, Ridge uh, matter resolved peacefully. Uh, clearly he went in to, to save Randy Weaver because Randy Weaver used to be one of his boys on the team. And, uh, <clears throat> it took, I mean, he was risking his own life. They could have just as easily dispatched him, too. So he's a man of great courage. I respect uh, what he's doing. I appreciate that uh, he's trying to make things happen, but I also know that he's going to be held in some type of villainous... Uh, no matter what he does, people are going to not understand, and they're going to be afraid. And, of course, the newspapers will continue to paint him as uh, whatever boogeyman in the closet they can. All right, we're going to go on with our programming here. <clears throat> we just uh, got a little off the track there, just a little bit, just to kind of let you give you an idea where we're coming from. We uh, we take a pretty serious attack on the Constitution, and we want to get into some other issues. <clears throat> we want to get into uh, things like things like money, 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 money. And one of the best tapes you can get is from a gentleman. Uh, we call him Ernie. Uh, he uh, basically is known throughout the movement around here. He delivers all the tapes and the what have you. And he has a tape called Wake Up America. And basically it starts telling you how money works and why it works and what they're doing with our money. And when you're done, you really understand what's going on. But we want to share some things with you about the money. And we got a good story to tell you too. But basically, we want to share with you right now in Michigan, the Michigan Compile Laws Programming. Can you see over there? We want to share with you up, up and to the left. All right, back. Okay. All right, we're cool. We're cool. All right. 21.153, Michigan Compile Laws Act. Obligations due state or municipality and date operative when paid by check or legal tender. Whenever any check or bank draft shall be tendered for the payment of any debt, taxes, or other obligation due the state or to any 
municipality therein such check draft shall operate as a payment made on the date the check or draft was received and accepted by the receiving officer if it shall be paid on the presentation without deduction for exchange or cost of collection all agencies of the state of Michigan shall request that checks tendered in payment of an obligation due the state shall be made payable to the state of Michigan. No receiving officer shall be required to receive in payment of any debt, taxes, or other obligation collectible or receivable by him any tender other than gold or silver coin of the United States. The United States Treasury notes, which you can't get today, gold certificates which you can't get today, silver certificates which you can't get today, or other Federal Reserve Bank notes. And there's no bank notes in circulation. There's Federal Reserve notes, but there's no Federal Reserve Bank notes. Now the reality is, by this fact, you are specifically precluded from tendering lawfully without being a party to a felony, that of debasement of the coin of the realm, against the 1792 Coinage Act, the Sherman Coinage Act. So Roger Sherman wrote a book about this, and... It tells you all about coinage and the debasement of the coin of the realm. And that's why he is affiliated with the 1792 Coinage Act. Now the reality to this is, what has been going on over a period of time is they've been playing games with the money. As we can see right here, we have right here a silver certificate. This certifies that there is on deposit in the Treasury of the United States one dollar, right, of silver. All right? one dollar in silver payable to the bearer on demand now we had a little time we got together and we had some of these notes we had some gold certificate notes also we got one here that says uh, we got one here that says uh, United States note the United States of America now notice the difference here folks this one just says this note is legal tender for all debts public and private but we know that that's a lie because article 1 section 10 of the constitution says nothing but gold and silver coin shall be made a tender in payment of debt now this is going to bring up a real interesting case that we got here now we went down to the federal reserve bank and we took five hundred dollars worth of uh, these are silver certificates here but we took gold certificates twenty dollar gold pieces we had five hundred dollars worth and we went into the federal reserve bank and I walked up to the window and I said, I'm the bearer on demand and lawful money of account of the United States government, sir. I said, I, I said, I want my gold. I handed her the notes. She looked at me and she says, sir, we don't have any gold. I said, are you trying to tell me this bank is overextended? Everybody looks. You can't come in here and do that, sir. You're going to get a run on the bank. I said, I'm, I'm asking you for my gold. I'm the bearer. I'm here and before you demanding. It says, pay to the bearer on the man and lawful money in the county of the United States government and $20 gold. I got $500 worth of these and I'll take $20 gold pieces. We don't have any gold. Are you trying to tell me this bank is overextended? So they called the SWAT team. This lieutenant comes running up and all these guys got rifles and they're all at port arms. And the lieutenant walks up to me and says, all right, what the hell is going on here? So I explained to him, I said, sir, I am the bearer on the man and lawful money of the county of the United States government. I'm here and before this bank, this is a lawful bank of the government, and I'm asking you, I'm asking them to pay me, the bearer, on demand, my $20 in gold for every one of these $20 gold demand deposit uh, notes that I have, and I have up to $500 worth, and I just asked her for the gold. She told me she doesn't have any gold. I tried to tell her, you told me this bank's overextended, and she told me, you can't come in here and do that, and the next thing you know, you show up. The lieutenant looked at him and said, why don't you get the guy his gold? Come on, guys, we're out of here. So they left. They couldn't give me my gold, because they ain't got any gold. But there is a contract on here that says pay to the bearer on demand. Now, in this one, it's a dollar of silver. In theory, the contract is there, and you could, in theory, go collect it. But upon trying to collect it, there is no gold. There is no silver. They don't have any. Now, over a period, a long period of time in barter, we have slowly been pushed into a position of, of impossibility to perform. Now, can the hat check be the hat? Can you walk in and check your hat and get a hat check? And then when you come back to get your hat back, they hand you another hat check? Can you walk in and check your hat and get a hat check? And then when you come back to get your hat back, 
they hand you another hat check can you wear the hat check obviously not so obviously the note is not the dollar all it is is the promise to pay a dollar does everybody understand that and what has happened over a long period of time in custom and uses is the people have been hoodwinked into thinking that they have money dollars there are no dollars dollar is a unit of measurement which brings up a very famous case the case of Montgomery Wards versus Eugene Glacier for those of you who want to order the case we'll be happy to give you the court case numbers let me take this off so it doesn't reflect too much this is a very famous case okay the docket number is 82-002087 this is before the honorable district court of 52nd third district court the judge of the record was the honorable James P Sheehy okay now I'll give you a little synopsis of this case what happened in this case did everybody get the court number first though 82-002087 all right now what happened in this case to make a long story short this gentleman's wife got a little mad at him and decided to take his credit card and go out and charge to Montgomery Wards from the front door to the back door and he ran up quite a large sum of debt the matter got of course Montgomery Wards wasn't going to take it back you bought it at yours you got it now they went to court and uh, came up before the, the, the famous judge James P. Sheehy of 52nd 3rd District Court who by the way is a very excellent judge very knowledgeable very very a decent man, a kindly man. He's pretty serious business, though. If you're screwing around, he's going to hammer you. But most of the time, he's uh, quite congenial and kind of a lot of fun, too. But it came up before his court, and up jumped the devil in the deep blue sea, and they're starting to argue. And the judge is saying, Well, let me ask you a question. He said, Did you get a credit card? He said, Yeah. So you signed for the credit card? He said, Yeah. So you get a credit card to your wife? He said, Yeah. He said, Here's the bill. You pay. He says, okay, judge, now let me explain something to you. You told me that the judgment is for this amount. Is that right? And I'm asking you, and you told me it's this many dollars, and I'm asking you for a determination of the dollars. Well, what dollars? He said, sir, you can interpret it any way you want. You can make it frankincense or myrrh. I don't care. I don't care if you don't even pay this judgment. I'll tell you what, don't pay it. There's a lot of documents in the basement. They never pay them says don't pay it we'll just take judgment against you and we'll attach it you know whatever we need for writs of attachment and we're going to collect on this debt he said sir you misunderstand my point now you you have told me uh, this amount of, of dollars and and I'm I'm confused here I need to know something about these dollars he says well he said let me clarify it for you I've entered a judgment against you for the amount due all right he said, yes, sir, but if I ask you for a pound of something, you're going to say a pound of what? And if I ask you for a gallon of something, you're going to say a gallon of what? And if I ask you for a foot or a yard of something, you're going to say a foot or a yard of what? Now, you're coming to me and telling me dollars, and I'm asking you dollars of what? Because dollar is a unit of measurement. He said, you can make it anything you want. Tell you what, make it coffee beans. Now, at that instant, the Montgomery Ward's attorney came to a half rise, and he went, Your Honor, Your Honor. There was 40 of us plus in the court, and we sat there, and all we could do was go, because <gasps> we realized instantly what this judge had just did. He had made a determination of the substance of the money of account of the United States government pursuant to coffee beans. With great courage, the Honorable Judge James P. Sheehy had made a determination that the substance of the money of account of the United States government was coffee beans. That's what we told the Wall Street Journal and all the newspapers and television stations that would listen. He was most upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> instantly the judge looked across the room we're all sitting with our jaw on the ground <gasps> and he leaned back in his chair flipped his pencil in the air and he said ah s with a hit on the record he realized that a landmark michigan court decision had occurred he realized that montgomery wards wasn't going to say nothing because they won they, they ain't going to appeal they won they what are they going to appeal you won you won you won you won it's nothing to appeal we weren't going to appeal because we won too we got the judge to make a determination that the substance of the money of the county of the united states government was coffee beans you can see in the back of this book here mr glacier took the judgment right here this was for 1098.97 he did it in 100 bean bags certified one bean to the dollar and 97 100 so we cut the tip of the bean off painted a white line on it he sent it to montgomery wards 
We got it on there? Mm -hmm. Please find enclosed in this package 1,100 and 48 coffee beans, which is payment in full, pursuant to Judge of the 52nd District Court, October 8, 1982, before this Honorable Judge James P. Shee. I thank you, sir, for your time and trouble concerning this matter. Most graciously, yours truly, Eugene Glacier. And it's certif certified mail sent to him. They never said nothing, nor would they, nor could they. He honored the stipulation of the judge, okay? Now, to this date, this gentleman comes to court with a big red bag, marble bag, well, the coffee beans that he's got stenciled on the side, Jean's Beans. I'll read you the last statement. It's just kind of hilarious. It's pretty good. He's asking for a determination of the substance of the money of account. I'll read you about the last three pages. He goes, all right. <clears throat> Therefore, really, out of his own testimony, it seems to me that judgment really is unavoidable in that amount. Thank you, Your Honor, the court. Anything else, sir? You have the right to a closing argument, Mr. Glacier. Only that I don't think I received a fair and equitable trial here today, the court. This is a closing argument regarding this trial, okay? As to the subject matter, Mr. Glacier, subject matter, I have nothing to add to the subject matter here, the court. The court makes the following finding of facts. That the court finds that pursuant to plaintiff's exhibit number one, that Mr. Glacier, Eugene Glacier, entered into a contract with Montgomery Wards and the company which it is a monthly account. Two, pursuant to plaintiff's exhibit number two, that the account was used by probably 95-99% of the time of the purchases by his wife while they were married. Number three, that for testimony of Mr. Davidson's unrebutted testimony, Mr. Davidson, the balance owing on the account is $1,098.97. And the court also finds that Mr. Grossman, Mr. Grossman's, excuse me, from Mr. Glacier's testimony that he just recently got divorced, approximately August 24, 1981. In that divorce proceeding, he accepted the liability to on this account as between he and his wife. Based upon the information, the court makes a conclusion of law that Mr. Eugene Glacier, defendant, this matter owes Montgomery Ward $1,988.97. The court finds a judgment in favor of plaintiff in the amount of plus costs. Mr. Glacier. You have a right to appeal this, and that appeal, I think, is in 15 or 20 days, Mr. Grossman. Mr. Grossman, 20, Your Honor, 21, actually, out of County 23. I think it's 20 all over now, Your Honor, the court. I think it is. It used to be 15 on some cases and 20 on others, and I could never keep it straight. But I think it's 20. You have a right to appeal in 20 days. If you appeal, let me explain to you how you do that. You have the file with the court. The circuit claim of appeal. Are those the ones that are marked by the way those exhibits? Mr. Grossman, oh yes, sir, Your Honor, that's right. The court. We better keep those. You can give him a copy of the other ones. By the, by the way, you, you can file a claim of appeal with the circuit court in this court. You also make a request to the court stenographer for a copy of the record. A copy of the record must file within a certain amount of time that you can tell you you must file, as I say, a claim of appeal, and then you have a certain number of days after that to file your appeal. Okay, claim of appeal is nothing more than a little form. I hereby claim appeal. Okay, so, but, some, but, the court clerks can give you more information. But if you don't file an appeal within 20 days, you've lost your right for an appeal. Any other questions before the court recesses? I'd still like to have a motion for a more definite statement. Dollars of what? Am I, do I owe the court dollars of what? The court. The court has made it. Now, this is this is after he had already told them dollars of what before. And the judge told him frankincense and myrrh. And then he kept hammering away at this dollars of what. And then the court lost its cool. The court has made a judgment of $1,098.97. And however you interpret that, sir, if you want that in coffee beans, that's okay with me. Really. Okay, thank you much. And at that point, we all went, ah. Oh. And he went, oh, S with a hit. <laughs> he realized he threw his pencil up in the air. Now, this is a magnificent case and an example. And to this day, this gentleman still pays court judgments with coffee beans. And it's a viable case. You can use the case as a reference. Uh, it's a landmark Michigan court decision. We, we use it thoroughly. Okay? Now, to make a long story short, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution is clear and specific. It says, nothing but gold and silver coins shall be made a tender in payment of debt. We want to give a number out on where to get those tapes, too. Uh, the tapes. It'll be on the end of the tape right at the beginning. Yeah, okay. All right. We want to make sure they get the tapes about Wake Up America. All right. All right. Now, we got Article 1, Section 10 right here. For those of you who are looking for 
No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. That's traffic tickets, folks. A bill of attainder is a traffic ticket. Can you see that right here? No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless by the rule of apportionment or census to Well, we'll talk about that later. That's another heavy one. All right. But Article 1, Section 10 is basically no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debt. Right here. No state shall enter into any treaty. Oh, wait, no, that's not right. Article 1, Section 10. Section 8. 10. It's Article 1, Section 10. No state shall make anything but silver coin. It's on the bottom of the page. All right, where's that? Oh, well, that's 9. That's why. Article 1. No, that is. It's towards the bottom of the page. The Are they changing the, this thing? It's in the middle. All right, here we go. It's in the middle paragraph. All right, here we go. Here we go. Right here. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation grant letters of mark and reprisal. A letter of mark or reprisal is like uh, your brothers messed with the king, so the king is going to attack your family and put a letter of mark out on them. Coin money. Emit bills of credit. What is a Federal Reserve note? Mm -hmm. Make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. Why? Because it creates inflation. you got to understand that paper money... If you can't redeem every piece of paper in the society, the amount that you can't redeem is inflation or credit. Credit is inflation. Right? Pass any bill of attainder. Huh? What is a bill of attainder? Again, a traffic ticket, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any title to nobility. When they give these guys these gun permits because they got $3,000 in their pocket and they're a rich businessman, isn't that a title of nobility? Because they get more rights. They're more politically correct than you. They have rights, you see. I mean, they violate so many things, it's not funny. It's never funny, but I'm just saying. I, I mean, you start reading this book, folks. I mean, I read it all the time, and I always find something new. This is kind of a book like the Bible. It's one of these books you can read and find something out of it all the time. The bottom line is you read the Constitution and you, you holler. You don't let these people jam your Constitution. You keep going. Now, we, we also know, we wanted to share with the, uh, the program, the Brenton Woods Agreement Act, because we're on the subject of money. Where are we doing that? We want to get into the militia, too. We got the militia. All right, we want to bring into some of these arguments, okay? We want to bring in. Uh, I want the militia. I want the. Uh, uh, I want treason. I want treason. I want to talk about that. All right, all right. Now let's let's talk about let's talk about treason here. Let's put this down here. What is treason? Right? Can you see that? Everybody see that? Title 18. This is this is the penal code, and we're talking about treason. Whoever owing allegiance to the United States levies war against them, or adheres to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort with in the United States or elsewhere, is guilty of treason, and shall suffer death. Or shall be imprisoned not less than five years and or fined not less than a ten thousand dollars and shall be impeachable of holding any office under the United States. All right. After this section, it gives you all of the reasons of how you can be charged with treason. But the basic issues come under adheres to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Now, breaking down the laws of our country has also been construed as giving the enemies aid and comfort. So if they're violating their oath of office and they're not upholding the Constitution, that is treason. Because in so doing, they create anarchy in the land. And in that, they aid the enemies of our country. Does that make legal sense to you? All right, now let's talk about some of the things that are going on in our country. 
let's talk about them. Let's talk about uh, where is that? I just had it here. What do we have here? We just had it here. We had it here. We want to talk about these treasonous acts, and we want to talk about things that are going on. This is the militia. All right, all right. Here we go. We want to talk about Title 20, 22, United States Code, Section 286A. Basically, the part that we want to talk about is the, the governor's and executive director's term of office. But basically, when we get over here, we really want to talk about the compensation for services. And this is Title 22, United States Code, Section 286A. All right? Okay? Compensation for services. No person shall be entitled to receive any salary or other compensation from the United States. Did everybody get that? From the United States for services as a governor, executive director, counselor, alternate, or associate. The United States executive director of the fund. What are we talking about here? The International Monetary Fund. Shall not be compensated by the fund at a rate in excess of the rate provided for an individual occupying positions at level four of the executive schedule under section 5315 of title five united states code all right the united states alternative executive director to the fund what fund the international monetary fund shall not be compensated by the fund at a rate in excess of the rate provided for and individual occupying a position of level five of the executive schedule under section 5316 of title five united states code the secretary of the treasury shall instruct the united states executive director of the fund to present to the funds executive board a comprehensive set of proposals consistent with the maintaining high levels of competence of the fund personnel and consistent with the articles of agreement with the objective of assuring that the salaries and or other compensations accorded fund employees who who fund international monetary fund do not exceed those received by persons filling similar levels of responsibility within the national government got me service or private industry the secretary shall report these proposals right together with any measures adopted by the funds executive board to the Congress prior to February 1, 1979. Now, folks, when they're talking about the fund, they're talking about the International Monetary Fund. And when they're talking about being paid, people like Janet Reno, who is a governor of the fund, is paid by the IMF. And who are they talking about? The Secretary of Treasury shall instruct who? Now, these people are paid by another government to our people. That is a violation of our laws. You understand? I mean, if they catch a congressman on the take, what happens? He's out of there. Why? Because it's considered to be unethical activity. Yet this foreign operating operating program, this International Monetary Fund, is paying our officers as executive officers. Who, whose interest do, you, do they serve? Do they serve the United States or do they serve the funds? Does that make sense to you? Okay. To me, this is an act of sedition or treason. The bottom line is they are not operating in the best interest of the United States of America. They are operating in their interest. And they are paid by a foreign power. And how can they sit in an office of government in the United States of America paid by a foreign power? It's inconceivable that this is going on. Now, we want to find out. Who gets our income tax to the fund? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely obscene. Now, what we want to do here is I want to figure out... Uh, we got the treason, so we know that's treason. <laughs> I mean, if they're operating outside, they're in treason, right? Now, the next thing we want to get... We want to get... The we want to get the militia up here. Now, folks, the militia is organized because they have been concerned about our Constitution getting dumped in the, in the, in the can. 
Oh, also, we want to show them this. These concurrent resolutions here, expressing the sense of the Congress regarding the need for the President to seek the Senator's advice and consent to ratification of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Okay. United Nations Consent on the Rights of the Child. Okay. John Conyers is in on this. He's one of our guys, too. Okay. Now, the bottom line is they're setting standards, all right? And on these standards, whereas it is estimated that every night in the United States at least 100,000 children go to sleep homeless, whereas, I mean, they make all these allegations, wherein the United States has the world's largest gross national product, yet American children rank below the top 15 nations in regard to the health and well-being. Whereas in 1989, the infant mortality rate for the United States ranked 19th in the world, being Singapore or Spain. I mean, they make all these allegations about the United States and the National Commission on Children has declared that every child in America needs an excellent education, yet approximately 40% of the nation's children are at risk of school failure. I mean, they go on and on. Whereas the United States, 2,600,000 children were reported to be abused and or neglected in 91. I mean, this is ridiculous. Whereas it's estimated that 1,800,000 teenagers were victims of violent crime. Whereas the Supreme Court has never fully articulated the range of rights to be accorded to children under the United States Constitution or fully articulated the manner in the Constitution as applicable to minors. It is. Whereas the positive futures of our families, communities, and nations are dependent. Now, you keep reading all these whereases. Whereas 29 others nations have signed convention indicating their intention to ratify the convention in the future. And then you get down. Whereas it is essential that the United States sign and ratify the convention on rights of the child and begin implement of convention legal standards in order to improve and protect the lives of children. Believe me, they're not trying to protect the lives of children. They're trying to create a new federal bureaucracy. Whereas at the World Summit of Children in September such and such to sign the World Declaration of Survival Protection and Development of Children, which would include commitment to work and promote earliest possible ratification and implementation under the United Nations and Conventions of the Right of the Child. Whereas the House of Representatives passed a resolution during the 101st Congress urging the President to seek consent of the Senate to ratification of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. But such action having not occurred, it is necessary that the Congress implore the President to take action on the Convention now. And now they want to push it. All right? Now, you got to understand, folks, they're not doing this for the children, believe me. They're doing it because they want to create some new kind of problem. Children, tomorrow, I apologize to you on behalf of those in my time for the things we didn't do. We didn't stop the tyrants so your fate could be prevented. We watched them steal our freedom, but our silence we consented. We didn't choose to circumvent the doom you've not escaped, while the Bill of Rights was murdered and the Constitution raped. Some of us were lazy and too busy, others too afraid, to think about our children, the ones we have betrayed. We say we were too busy to be concerned or care, to try to ease the burden of the chains we've made you wear. A debt of 17 trillion, more money than exists, because we fail to heed God's call of usury resists. We could have been good shepherds when the wolf got in the fold, Yet watch the flame of freedom die, which leaves you in the cold. We changed our great republic, which was forged in blood for liberty, to a socialist welfare state, which we call democracy. I'm sorry we were so timid, betrayed by a selfish generation. We left yet a remnant of a free and prosperous nation. I'm sorry for our action like sheep we have behaved. We could have left you freedom, instead you are enslaved. Children of tomorrow, descendants of our land, I am sorry we allowed this fate, you now must understand. Children of tomorrow, educate yourself if by reading the Bible of the Bible to break the chains we left you with maintain. God's Ten Commandments, use reason, logic, and common sense. Suffer the little children to come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. Dennis Byron this come off of the Amateur Radio Freeman's Bulletin Board, August, September 1992, end of transmission. So I think you can see here, at one time they pretend to do all this, and yet 
on the other, they do all that. So I thought this was very poignant uh, thing to put out on the air and try and hammer across, okay? Now we want to cover some other things. We want to cover the Brentwoods Agreement Act. We're trying to hustle up here. What do we got down there? Let's see. Hang loose here. That's just like a little pull it. That's the treason statutes, the 22 USC. We want to go for. That's the area railroad versus Tompkins. That's the last thing I want to cover. United States. We got Marshall versus Kansas. We got uh, constitutional arguments. We got civil rights. We want to share so many arguments. Oh, yeah, we want to cover the 1 207. Remember, I told people about the 1 207? We want to cover about the 1-207. Remember I told you sign your name, 1-207 UCC, 1-207 without prejudice. This is it right here, folks. This is uh, the 1-207 Uniform Commercial Code. Can you get that? Okay. Got it? All right. This section provides machinery for the continuation of performance along the lines contemplated by the contract. What contract? The bankruptcy contract. Despite, that's in 1933, depending, all right, pending dispute by adopting the mercantile device of going ahead with delivery acceptable acceptance or payment without prejudice, under the protest, under reserve, with reservation of all our rights and the like all of those all of these phrases completely reserve all rights within the meaning of this section this section therefore contemplates that limited as well as general reservations and acceptance by a party may be made subject to Satisfaction of our purchaser, subject to acceptance by our customer, or the like. This section does not add any new requirement of language, of reservation, where not already required by law, but merely provides a specific measure on which a party can rely as he makes or concurs in any interim adjustment in the course of performance. When they say performance, they're talking about contractual performance. It does not affect or impair the provisions of this act, such as those under which the buyer's right, remedies for defect survive acceptance without being expressly claimed. If notice of the defect is given within a reasonable time, nor does it disturb the policy of those cases which restrict the effect of a waiver of a defect to reasonable limits under the circumstances even though no such reservation is expressed. Now this is all what they're talking about when you write down without prejudice. They're telling you you have a right to reserve your right. So I'm telling you to use it. Don't screw around. Sufficiency of the reservation. Any expression. Can you see that? Any expression indicating an intention to preserve rights is sufficient, such as without prejudice, under protest, under reservation, with reservation of all our rights, under duress is another one. The code states an explicit reservation must be made. Explicit. Undoubtedly, is used in place of express to indicate that the reservation must not only be express but it must also be clear under duress that such a reservation was intended in advance right the term explicit as used in UCC 1-207 means that which is so clear 7 means that which is so clearly stated or distinctly set forth that there is no doubt as to its meaning. Okay? Now that is the reservation I want you to claim. 
I want you to screw around. I want you to use your head for something other than a hat rack. Because I'm telling you, you just do it. Too. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, you don't tell them nothing. You sign it and you walk out. When they ask you what that is, just say that's something I put down on my signature every time so I know it's me. Okay? You, you're not, you didn't learn all this stuff overnight. And you, you're not going to give somebody these classes overnight. Believe me. If you think you're going to teach somebody this stuff all night, you're dreaming. It takes a long time of serious study to get to the level of where you're at. And you're not going to deliver that to anybody overnight. So my sincere advice is don't try and do it because it ain't going to happen in your lifetime. Just sign it. Do what you're supposed to do. If people want to listen, then you let them listen. If they don't want to listen, then you say, oh, well, I knew that. Okay? Now, let's go on here because i got a bunch of stuff to cover and we're running out of time. All right, what do we got here? All right, we want to cover the militia. There's a lot of people you're hearing talking about the militia. I want to get the Brenton Woods Agreement Act, too, if we can. Let me see here. I know we had it. Oh, Lord. <coughs> this is the hard part, keeping track of everything. Okay. All right, we will find it. I promise you that. All right, what we want to do... We want to show off some of these things. Under executive order of the President, all persons required to deliver on or before May 1st, 1933. Try and blow that up. That's a good one. That's all your gold and silver. I want to make sure we get into all kind of arguments here real quick. Do we have some gold and silver? By law? Should we have some? Yes, set? yes. I think you should Can set aside some serious money to put in. I think people shouldn't have everything in gold and no. silver, though. I think you should have... I think you should buy toilet paper, and I think you should buy food, and I think you should buy cough medicine, and I think you should buy laundry soap, and I think you should buy, you know, have some stuff around like you would keep your normal business and put a little bit in gold and silver. I think you should have a pump shotgun in your closet to defend your house. Something, yeah, something to defend your house. Not that you may need it, but if you do, you got it. I think you ought to seriously consider... All right, we got the militia here. That's the, one of the next biggies we want to talk about, the militia. All right, let's do that. I'll bring that Bretton Woods Agreement Act in yet. But that's also serious. Cause, oh, here we go. Here we go. That is good. Here we go. Here we go. Now, here we go, folks. This is the Bretton Woods Agreement Act. And this is the Agreement Act that, that created this problem with this Title 22 United States Code Section 286. Okay. This is heavy duty, folks, so uh, remember I showed you about treason. Okay. No person shall be entitled to receive any salary or other compensation from the United States for services as a government executive director, counselor, alternate, or, or associate, right? Congress, by law, authorizes such action. Neither the president nor any person or agency shall, on behalf of the United States, request or consent to any change in the quota of the United States under Article 3, Section 2, the Articles of Agreement of the Fund, the Fund, the International Monetary Fund. All right, let's pull it up here. All right, they're talking about dollar under Paragraph 6. Okay, that's not what I want. I want... Let's see, make any loan to the fund or bank, approve the establishment of any additional trust fund for the special benefit of the single member or of a particular segment of membership of the fund. Yeah. All right, let's see, in order to carry out the purposes of the decisions of January 1962 of the executive directors of the International Monetary Fund, the Secretary of the Treasury is authorized to make loans not to exceed two, looks like billion, yep, outstanding at any one time to the fund. If it sounds like I'm hammering on that fund, that's because I am. Under Article 7, Section 1, subparagraph I of the Articles of Agreement of the Fund, I mean, they set this thing up. 
the Secretary of the Treasury, with the approval of the President, directly or through such agencies as he may designate as authorized for the account of the fund established in this section to deal in gold and foreign exchange and such other instruments of credit and or securities as he may deem necessary to the consistent constituent or no consistent and consistent with the United States obligations in the International Monetary Fund. The Secretary of the Treasury shall annually make a report on the operation of the fund to the President and to the Congress. That makes the Secretary of Treasury what? An officer of the fund. Okay, the Secretary of Treasury, yeah, he is guilty. The Secretary of Treasury is authorized to issue gold certificates in such form and in such denomination as he may determine against any gold held by the United States Treasury. The amount of gold certificates issued and or outstanding shall at no time exceed the value at the legal standard provided in Section 2 of Power Value Modification Act 31, United States Code, 449, on the date of enactment of this amendment of the gold so held against gold certificates. They're in the gold certificates. All right. The amendment made by sections 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 of this act shall become effective upon entry into the force of the amendments approved in the resolution number 31-4 of the Board of Governors of the Fund. Now, this is called the Brentwoods Agreement Act, folks. And this is what set up Title 22, United States Code, Section 286A, which says that these officers are paid out of the fund. They're not paid as United States employees. Capiche? Is there any doubt in your mind now who gets paid where? They don't. We don't pay them. They're paid by somebody else, the fund. Who is the fund? All of those rich guys that are sitting over in Europe that are trying to control our country. All right. Now, okay. Let's move on here. We got things to do. I want to show you something else too. Let's look at the very first book of Title to of the United States Code's annotated. And I don't care which section you grab. Grab either uh, Lawyer's Edition, or if you grab, uh, I want you to take a particular note to this and pay close attention. I want this amplified if you can do it. I want it to read right here, the part where it says this title has been enacted into positive law. Notice the little asterisk right here, folks. There's a little asterisk right here. Everybody see that? Can you see that? You see my pen? Move it till you see my pen point come in. You see my pen point? All right, all right. This title has been acted in as positive law. Okay? Notice the little asterisk. When you come down here, and all these titles that got the little asterisk, they're all part of the law. Title 11 bankruptcy, Title 13 census, Title 14 Coast Guard, you know, copyrights, you got crimes and criminal procedure, Title 18, right? Now, I want you to notice something as we come over to Title 26 here. Title 26 is the Internal Revenue Code. It's never been enacted into law, it's a regulation. Can you get it? Can you get it? See that? Look closely. Title 26 and Title 27. Do you see an asterisk there? You don't see one, do you? No, sir. <coughs> That's because there ain't one. <coughs> now, let's look at the other version. The other version is exactly the same. and this, this is the one out of the official U.S. reports for titles. And this one says, can you get my pen? You tell me when. All right, sir. Okay. This title has been enacted as law. Look at all the titles that got an asterisk. You'll notice again. Title 26 and Title 27, Zippo, no asterisk. Everybody see that real clear? Pull it over. No asterisk. Obviously, it's never been enacted as law. How could it be? I'll tell you how. we got a case over here called Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, and I'm going to bring it to your attention. Erie Railroad versus Tompkins is a magnificent court case. Basically, what this court case did... This court case is recorded at Volume 304, United States Reports, Section, or page 64. This is the start of the case. That's 304, Volume 304, United States Reports, Section 604. Now, what this case does is it sets up a duality of citizenship. There are the citizens that live at the